Coming up, a Lakota metalsmith shares his craft, plus a visual artist breaks down his love of art, and Racing Magpie tells us how they have been building community with art and cultural programming. I am Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Join us for those interviews plus headlines, the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Chinangale, we're so glad you could join us. Aaliyah is away. We start our newscast at the White House in Washington, D.C., where a member of the First Family held a first-of-its-kind celebration. First Lady Jill Biden hosted around 300 Indigenous people in the East Room to recognize November's Native American Heritage Month. She spoke to tribal leaders, Indigenous lawmakers, athletes, and even movie stars. My husband continues to listen and to learn from your voices, and more importantly, to act. Just yesterday, the White House convened a tribal youth forum where young people, I see a lot of you shaking your heads, <laughs> where a lot, a lot of young people from around the country came together with administration officials to map out the progress they wish to create. And he is looking forward to welcoming tribal leaders for the White House Tribal Nation Summit at the end of this month. Also in attendance was the first Native American Cabinet Secretary, Deb Holland, who gave a speech. With this celebration comes the somber reminder that for too long, Indigenous peoples have been forced to the margins. We see that in the disproportionate and devastating impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on Native communities. We see it in the historical lack of funding to address the missing and murdered Indigenous peoples crisis. And we see it in our work to address the harmful legacy of the federal Indian boarding schools and other intergenerational assimilation policies. But the good news is Indigenous people and Indigenous knowledge are at the decision-making tables and we aren't going back. The White House says it was the first time it has hosted a reception in honor of Native American Heritage Month since the month started being celebrated in 1990. We should note that Aliyah Chavez attended this event as well as ICT's Jordan Bennett Begay and Polly Dinetclaw. In Peru, indigenous groups are seeking to stop oil exploration in their lands. Last week, indigenous leaders requested the government and banks to stop oil exploration and investment in Peruvian indigenous territories. Protests sparked across native territories after two oil spills by the state oil company Petro Peru, one in 2014 and a second in September of this year. The government declared a state of emergency and the general attorney's office informed that the spill was due to an intentional cut of the pipeline. President of the Ashwar Federation says the state's oil company, Petro Peru, has caused generational damage to their people. The reason why I'm here is because of the problems we are experiencing today in our territory, because of the oil activities that are carried out in our territory, which have caused so much damage to our population, to our generations. The company Petro Peru has been in business for 40 years and has had certain negative processes making the oil spill very constant. Indigenous leaders say they also plan to meet with Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and Bank of America. 
a Clinket artist in Canada's Yukon is a finalist for a very prestigious award. Artist Crystal Silverbox is one of five finalists for this year's Sobe Art Award. APTN's Fraser Needham has the story. Earlier this week, Silver Fox could barely hide her enthusiasm. She'd been selected for the Sobe short list. Oh, it's surreal. <laughs> I can't believe they, that I made it this far. I am so thrilled. I grew up in Vancouver. I live in the Yukon, so I could not be more thrilled to represent the West Coast Yukon. And it, it, it's just so touching to be here. Silver Fox's work tends to focus on the theme of decolonization, often using materials such as copper and Hudson Bay blankets. Three of her most recent works, All That Glitters Is Not Gold, Copper and Concrete, and Landmarks, are currently on display at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. And as gallery associate curator, Wasantio Santillo Cross points out, the interdisciplinary artist's work is gaining notice. To take something that is valuable in that way and then to turn it into something that is a commodity, um, you know, with the, the pennies as well, and they have the, the stamp of the, the queen's head, so there, there's so it's so rich um, when you really look into the materials that are used. Silver Fox explains the importance of copper in her work. So we would actually use copper to trade with the Clinket people, and they would actually create um, copper shields, knives, um, all sorts of different tools. We also made copper, <laughs> copper um, knives and such, but it's not as, I guess, documented as the Clinket people. And the Hudson Bay Blanket. The Hudson Bay Blanket also has this unfortunate um, history of spreading disease. So I'm thinking a lot about the Hudson's Bay blanket as a colonial tool that I rip apart as, a, as an act of decolonization. But also I'm thinking about the, the act as like reflecting back to my identity as an Northern Dachoni woman. And her advice for young and aspiring Indigenous artists? I say use anything and everything to make your art. If it's garbage, so be it. You know, our objects around us say so much about our worlds and our experiences and don't give up on it. The Sobe Art Award winner will be announced on November 16th. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. John Gozen Center is an Oglala Lakota metalsmith, carver, and culture bearer. Born along Rapid Creek Indian Camp, Rapid City, South Dakota, Gozen Center explains why artist is a title that doesn't quite fit him. I don't in so much use the title as artist. I, uh, I consider myself a creative because I, I create in other realms other than just making uh, dormant pieces. But I, 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 I do a lot of other things too. So that's the kind of profiles, I would say, the creativity of... Uh, Native people, you know, because we're all ingenious. We, we're, we're making new things, creating new things, uh, inventing new things, repairing things, adapting things. And the, so it just brings together, together all of our, uh, our attributes as being resourceful, creative people. So uh, that's why I'm a creative, not an artist. You could say survived the boarding school, you know, but but I also served in the military and, uh, but I uh, got a degree in museum studies. I was really interested in the antiquities of our culture in particular. You know, uh, I was kind of raised with my grandmother. So seeing the old timers talk and seeing things that they had. I mean, I just, all those things interest me about our culture, so. Gozen Center tells us more about his background in technology. I uh, finished in 1974 and at the University of Colorado, but hard to get a job in a museum in them days. But anyway, uh, I went on to uh, develop a technical career at IBM and I worked there 17 years and learned a lot about technology. And in particular, uh, I worked in advanced technologies, uh, laboratories, and, and it was exposed to emerging technologies. And when I heard about geographic information systems, computerized mapping, it just fell in place for me to say, this is what Native people need. And in fact, today, many tribes are doing it and using it. But it was implemented by the BIA, which was more for self-serving for them. And 
managing our lands and leases, you know, but now we are doing things ourselves. So I'm still involved in that technology work. I've actually gone on to do work in Canada, helping First Nations with treaty and helping them develop maps. And I can tell the whole story about their their kind of maps. But but even today, I'm still doing that. I'm working with a broad organization called the Capacity Building Center for Tribes. And we're helping tribes, and I'm in with a team for technical services, doing uh, needs assessments, implementation strategies. The metalsmith talked about a recent mapping project that could benefit the Indian Child Welfare Act. Right now I'm working on a project to help the Yurok tribe inventory and make a map of all their social welfare resources, not only within their tribe, within the tri-county area. And this is all for social welfare and child protective services. So when I was first asked about doing this, it, I just like, wow, that's so great that we're pushing the technology in a humanistic uh, way where it's not just managing resources. We're, we're, we're preventing and healing the social system through technologies like that. So this technology I work with answers this question, where are your children? So you can see its applications in ICWA and all kinds of other things in the tribe. So I, I'm still, I haven't retired, so I'm still, <laughs> but I do my artwork and that's my sanity. You know, it's like, it grounds me, brings me back to my childhood, my raising, my understanding how my ancestors lived at one time. The true essence of their, of their uh, creativity has to do with living in harmony it's such an expression, you know, that, that they, our ancestors, reached a point of equilibrium with their environment. And so I always coined them as being spiritually intelligent, you know, so. Gozen Center discussed how his art fits into Lakota culture. Those are inspirations I, I kind of live, live with, and hopefully I can express that through my own creativity in different ways, you know. But like I said, making jewelry or, you know, doing those kind of things in the culture, with the culture, for the culture. I mean, that, that's what I'm all about. But people see pictures in them. They see a lot of things in the patterns of these agates, you know. And yes, I, I see landscapes in them, you know. And in fact, some of my engraving that I do mimics the horizon, the the pinnacles, the, the, the you know, the, anything that flows, I, I articulate them and I create an abstract geometric design out of them, which I think, when I think of those, the parfleche designs, those those are the woman's worldview. You know, they we, we had men's art and women's art, and they were complementary. The women's worldview, they were able, able to create these abstract geometric designs. Men did more of the pectoral designs, you know, so our art at that time, you know, historically was, you know, integrated to, to reflect man and woman and gender balance, you know. Yeah, that's the way I see it. And so, But what I do with my engraving is to not stamp work, but to engrave in metal and preserve those, uh, those uh, abstract geometric designs that, that reflect the landscape, the cosmos, you know, uh, symbologies for our spiritual realm that we live in, you know, just, yeah. So I think that's, that's what we should be doing as artists, you know, and I, I'm not creating this for the non-native world. It's for me and my relatives. That was John Gozen Center in an interview with ICT Shirley Snavy. When we come back, an Oglala artist depicts contemporary Native American life. Keith Braveheart is a professor at Oglala Lakota College, where he's lived most of his life. The filmmaker and a guest curator for the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian talks about beginning his life as an artist. I never really had an aspiration to be an artist as a youth, but I think it's just kind of at that turning point whenever I had to graduate from high school, I was like, what's next? So I was lucky to find out uh, of the Oscar House Summer Art Institute, which is like an art camp for two weeks at the University of South Dakota. 
and when I arrived there and it was all be based off of my like um, I guess talent that was becoming um, visible to my instructors in grade school my teachers in grade school but when I got to the Oscar House Summer Art Institute I, I found more about this um, just vast world that existed when it came to native arts and so it really made me um, decide then that I wanted to pursue that journey and it had to begin with education as well too so the instructors I had at that art camp also uh, notified me about um, art programs out there and particularly the Institute of American Indian Arts which was one of the leading if not at the time probably the only one that was really uh, for native students I know there's programs in our state, but that was the one that was encouraged the most because of its legacy as well too, with all the different artists who have gone through there. So I applied and I got in and once I was there, then I kind of realized like, this is the path that I should be on. And so it just became so um, overwhelming in a good way where, you know, um, discovering all these great artists, like I was talking about Austin Rave, you know, finding him amongst the great names like TC Cannon and Alfred Youngman and all these different artists who kind of established like a, a very milestone in our uh, continuum of native arts uh, that kept motivating me and pushing me to want to keep like just at it and then of course all my friends who were there with me as well too we kind of helped motivate each other to just keep keep with it you know in a good competitive way we always want to do your best so that just has stuck in stuck with me you know in light of any other challenge or obstacle that could occur in lifestyle I just always remain um, dedicated to being an artist, you know. The Lakota visual artist talks about being a lover of art. And I think you have to have a love and appreciation to just like want to be around art. You want to view art. You want to engage with art. You want to communicate with art uh, much more than you just probably want to make it for yourself. So I think just having these values as a native person, as a Lakota person, kind of helped me to not feel like selfish in a way. Like I had to go out and always be the one that was uh, demanding attention. Like whenever I made art, it wasn't had to be like, it was all about my work, you know? Like I have more appreciation and fun when I get to like uh, visit with the artists that I look up to. So I always say that like I'm a, I'm a viewer of art before I'm an artist as well too. So I think that's kind of one of the things that pulls me away from making so much art my, myself because I'd rather support others before I kind of support myself. But I'm getting to that age where I'm, I'm going to start to be very selective and, and make uh, hard no's and say I have to kind of start getting the, the rest of these years out of my life that I need to make art as well, too. Braveheart breaks down the history for one of his paintings. It was untitled, but then in parentheses, I kind of had a little like uh, humor and I put Watecha Shni, meaning like no leftovers. It was just a sincere painting that I did, and it's actually my auntie my eldest auntie, she's the oldest out of my um, my um, grandmother's children. Her name's Mercy Iron Crow. And the, the little girl that's there, that's her great granddaughter. And that story is pretty tragic for that little, um, for both of them because um, my cousin, her name was Crystal Red Owl, uh, she, she passed away and, um, and she had a daughter who, who was young, who would have been my niece. And that was the mother of that little girl in that painting. But she also passed away as well, too. And these were tragic deaths that are kind of common, you know, in a sad way amongst our communities. So instead of kind of like focusing on, on that part of like, you know, our story, I wanted to uplift my relatives. But I also wanted to like really show my, my um, auntie that I cherish her. She's become the matriarch after our grandmother passed away. And she's also... Um, really like uh, active in that role of being a grandmother because she took that little one who didn't have her own mother or her grandmother and she's raised her since she was a little girl and and you can see how like just a, a big impact it had on that little girl's life because she understands Lakota language. It's my my uh, auntie is one of the last fluent speakers so you can tell that little one's like really like gaining the benefits of growing up in that household. So um, I wanted to paint them just because I felt like they really had a, a really nice story, but also um, just a vi uh, interesting visual as well. <clears throat> and as a contemporary artist, I always like to kind of uh, play with these contrasts of, of our different kind of cultural spheres. So thinking of, of Native peoples, how they um, are, a lot of the things we do in our culture are based around food. You know, we have feasts. It's very central to like just our community and our society. 
So seeing these uh, two native uh, individuals in front of this uh, buffet, <laughs> Golden Corral, but also a, a visible landmark here in Rapid City, I felt like that would be something that would bring people in at first glance, like they're familiar with what that looks like. But when they come in, they see things that are really um, sincere and authentic. That was Oglala artist Keith Braveheart. Racing Magpie was awarded $40,000 over two years from the Wagner Foundation and via Art Fund. Peter Strong and Mary Bordeaux talk about the grant. Consortium of funders on the East Coast who came to get, who come together to support arts organizations around the country that are trying to push forward uh, or foster like ongoing dialogue about important um, artistic and creative endeavors. And so we we were encouraged by a few other people to put our hats in the in the ring, and we applied and were awarded it uh, earlier this year. And it's a um, it's intended to be like general operating support as far as far as the funds go, just to support us in continuing to do what we're doing. And then um, we're part of a cohort. So by the end of our two year run, we're going to visit with the other organizations and become part of this. Um, national network of organizations trying to do this. Mary and Peter break down the history of Racing Magpie. So um, we actually started out as a LLC um, and we're, um, you know, similar to what we do now, uh, artist studios, community space, and a gallery. Um, but, you know, Racing Magpie, um, actually we wanted to just be a gallery and like an office space and then, um, then we, some of our friends who are artists and work in the creative field were like, oh, we, I, I need an office space and we don't need a lot. So maybe we could go in together. Um, and then an artist was like, it would be cool if I could have a studio space. And we're like, yeah, that would be cool. And then pretty soon what was going to be like an office and a gallery turned out to be like 8,500 square feet of like studio space and classroom space and nonprofit office space. And it just kind of grew. And, um, you know, as we were like seven years old um, now, and, you know, in the within the first couple of years, um, really just heard from a lot of artists and community, um, the needs that they had and wanted and um, to be able to spend time together and have these flexible, flexible spaces to um, do like sewing circles or um, community meetings or um, um, I was trying to think of the other things that classes. we've had. We've had classes and um, workshops and things like that too. So, um, and so we've been trying to be just really responsive to what the community needs. And um, we started out in downtown Rapid City um, and then have within the past couple of years, we were able to purchase a building or two buildings. It was kind of a two for one. Had, if we wanted one, we had to buy the other one too. So <laughs> we have two buildings and similar square footage now, and um, but realizing that we needed more flexible space than artist space, because um, uh, and so that's and but we have a bigger gallery now, and yeah. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, just to reframe what Mary's saying too, I think. One thing we started out with and we've been really focused on with our board and our work is this idea of recentering the conversation about arts and culture around the artists and the community. I think like that's a big picture shift that that we it's just natural to Mary and me and to the folks who interact with us regularly, but I think it's not so common in non-native art settings and and elsewhere even around here in in the rapid city area or in south dakota you know studio spaces and and space and programming for folks to talk to each other and listen and share ideas and be inspired and a gallery that's for native artists um that's not based on solely on sales right mm -hmm. like taking some of the market pressure off of artists how can we curate exhibits where artists can really explore their creative expression and the impact that has on issues like racism in South Dakota and Rapid City or, um, yeah, I mean, all those issues, right? Like, I think art is that place where those conversations 
can start among people with differing, different ideas and different backgrounds. And I, I'd like to think that we've been doing that over the last seven years and and we keep trying to center that in the work we do in the future. Racing Magpie director Peter Strong talks about what motivates him to stay in the area. I think that's everyone who moves <laughs> here. Just two to three years and yeah, here I am. And um, and it's the place and it's the artists and it's the the family, right? Um, being married into a Lakota family. And it's important to be here and build relationship and and follow through on those relationships too. So for me as a white guy uh, who grew up in Ohio and who's lived in a few different places, it it's about relationship with people and place and um, Racing Magpie, I think centers that as well in everything we do. That was Peter Strong and Mary Bordeaux. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. The Sand Creek Massacre, the betrayal that changed Cheyenne and Arapaho people forever, focuses on tribal accounts of Colorado's deadliest day. Exhibition details at HistoryColoradoCenter.org. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.